Bhagavate Vasudeva Janmad Yasya Yato Niviyad Itaratas Charte Suavigyaswara Janmad Yasya Yatamva Itaratas Charte Suavigyaswara Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyantiyat Surayaha Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyantiyat Surayaha Tejo Varimidam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Trisargomesha Tejo Varimidam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Trisargomesha Damna Svena Siddha Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi Damna Svena Siddha Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi Oh my Lord, Sri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva Oh my Lord, Sri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva Oh all-pervading personality of God for all providing personality of Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primary cause of all causes. The primary cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. Is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? Is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? The original living being. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations. Of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes. Only because of him do the material universes. Temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature. Temporarily manifested by the reaction of the three modes of nature. Appear factual, although they are unreal. Appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon Him, Lord Sri Krishna. I therefore meditate upon Him, Lord Sri Krishna. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode? Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode? Which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representation of the material world. I meditate upon Him, for He is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Him, for He is the absolute truth. Dharma Pujita Kaitavotra. Dharma Pujita Kaitavutta Paramo Nirmat Saranam Satam Paramo Nirmat Saranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Sivadam Tapa Trayon Bhumana Sivadam Tapa Trayon Bhumana Srimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Srimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimva Parir Ishwaraha Kimva Parir Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avurudyate Tra Sadyo Hridi Avurudyate Tra Ati Bihi Susus Vistakshana Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understood by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. They have to be the reality distinguished from religion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. Is, is, is sufficient in itself for God realization. Is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? What is the need of the other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By this culture of knowledge. By this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpatarur galitam falam. Nigama kalpatarur galitam falam. Sukumukad amrita drabya samyutam. Sukumukad amrita drabya samyutam. Ibata Bhagavatam rasam alayam. Vibhata Bhagavatam Prasamalaya Muhur Ahurasika Bhuvibhavakaha Muhur Ahurasika Bhuvibhavakaha O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures It emanated from the lips of Sri Sugadev Goswami Therefore this fruit has become even more tasteful Therefore this fruit has become even more tasteful Although its nectar and juice is already relishable for all his nectarian juice was already visible for all. Including liberated souls. Including liberated souls. 
Shinvatam Swakata Krishna. Sambantam Sakata Krishna. Vinya Shravana Kirtana. Vinya Shravana Kirtana. Hidyantakstohi Abhatrani. Hidyantastohi Abhatrani. We do not eat Satam. We do not eat Satam. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures. Or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita. Or to hear from him directly through Bhagavad Gita. Is it self righteous activity? And for one who hears about Krishna, and for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling within everyone's heart, Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend, acts as a best wishing friend, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him, and purifies the devotee who is constantly engaged in hearing of him. Nasta praesu bhadresu, nasta praesu bhadresu, nityam bhagavata sevaya, nityam bhagavata sevaya, bhagavati uttamas loke, bhagavati uttamas loke, bhakti bhavati naistiki, bhakti bhavati naistiki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. In this way, the words naturally develop his dominant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. As he hears more about Krishna from Bhagavatam. And from the devotees. And from the devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. He becomes fixed in his devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Kamalo badayas chaye. Kamalo badayas chaye. Chaita etar anavidam. Chaita etar anavidam. Stitvam satve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, by developing of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance, and thus lust and avarice are diminished. And thus lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasanna manaso. Evam prasanna manaso. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Mukta sangha sajayate. Mukta sangha sajayate. When these impurities are wiped away, these impurities are wiped away. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. The candidate becomes enlivened by devotional service. And understands the science of God perfectly. Understand the science of God. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Siddhyante sarva samsaya. Siddhyante sarva samsaya. Siddhyante chasya karmani. Siddhyante chasya karmani. Krista eva atmanishwari. Krista eva manishwari. Thus Bhakti Yoga serves the heart not of material affection. Thus the Bhakti Yoga serves the heart not of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage with samsaya samsaya. And enables to come at once to the stage of assumption of Samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead. Understanding the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna. Or from his devotees. Or from his devotees. In Krishna consciousness. Can one understand the science of Krishna? Can one understand the science of Krishna? Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 17, Verse Number 13. Akyahi Vrishabhadramba. Akyahi Vrishabhadramba. Sadhunam Akritagasam. Sadhunam Akritagasam. Atma Vairupya Kartaram. Atma Vairupya Kartaram. Partanam Kirti Dushanam. Partanam Kirti Dushanam. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. O oh, bull, you are offenseless and thoroughly honest. Therefore, I wish all good to you. Please tell me of the perpetrator of these mutilations, which blackmail the reputation of the sons of Prita. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The reputation of the reign of Maharaja Ramachandra and that of the kings who followed in the footsteps of Maharaj Ramachandra, like the Pandavas and their descendants, are never to be forgotten because their kingdom, because in their kingdom, offenseless and honest living beings were never in trouble. The bull and the cow are symbols of the most offenseless living beings because even the stool and urine of these animals are utilized to benefit human society. 
the descendants of the sons of Prita, like Maharaj and Parikshit, were afraid of losing their reputations. But in the modern days, the leaders are not even afraid of killing such offenseless animals. Herein lies the difference between the reign of those pious kings and the modern states ruled by irresponsible executive heads without knowledge of the codes of God. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So cow dung and cow urine, go, uh, go bar and go murtra, are beneficial for human society. In fact, everything that comes from the cow, even when the cow dies, its horns, its skin, its, its hooves are all used. They're all uh, useful things. And when the cow is alive, the stool, the urine, the milk, the yogurt, and the cheese are all beneficial for people. In fact, there's a large body of knowledge about the stool and the urine, and especially the urine, because it can heal many, many diseases. And it's been used traditionally for thousands and thousands, maybe millions of years in India for healing. And then the, the stool of the cow is also healing in many ways. Like when Krishna's uh, attempt was made by Putana to poison Krishna, what did they do? They bathed his body, they first smeared cow dung on his body. And then, I guess, uh, with some urine also. And then uh, they bathed his body with milk. And, and, and the milk also contains <coughs> uh, ghee or butter. And they said prayers and they applied tilak. And then everything was okay. So nowadays when a baby is born, sometimes they use formaldehyde it's a horrible uh, chemical, or other things to purify the body of the baby. Right. Of course, if you if you see, if you bring some cow dung into the hospital and you say, "Well, can, you, can we bathe my baby with some cow dung?" They would freak out. They would say, "What? This is crazy! It's it's contaminated. You know, you're going to give us all uh, coronavirus 24 with this thing." You know, but uh, we have to. Carefully study the uh, Krishna book or the or the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam to understand the culture of Vrindavan and just do those things that they were doing because that is the perfection in the spiritual world. Things in the spiritual world are perfect. Things in the material world are imperfect. So why should we and then what else do they do? They want to give an injection. Of a, of a two day old baby. They said, Oh, it's got jaundice. We have to give an inje injection. Well, every baby has jaundice the first couple of days because their, their organs are not working uh, as they should right away. But if they get their mother's milk, and that's the point, uh, the women that get pregnant, uh, the, the, uh, forming of the child's baby is going to all happen due to the energy uh, supplied by the mother. What is that energy? It's called glucose. The breaking down of carbohydrates into a, the most simple sugar, which is glucose. So the mother has to have a very good uh, diet and good habits. I remember my sister-in-law, uh, one of my brothers, uh, she was a smoker. She used to always smoke all the time. And she worked for the IRS. Uh, and uh, when she got pregnant, she had uh, uh, a uh, interruption of pregnancy. In other words, the, the, uh, she was not able to hold the, uh, the, f the fetus. And it never, I don't think it ever occurred to her that it was because of her smoking. She was a chain smoker. So this happens a lot, not even to people, even to women who don't smoke. Sometimes they lose the, the fetus. 
But it all depends on their health. And the, the, because the, the, the child or the baby in the womb is going to draw a lot of uh, minerals and other things from the mother. And if the mother is not in good health and is weak, then if the baby is born, the baby remains uh, poor health almost uh, throughout all of their whole life. Uh, and this is because of uh, bad practices, dietary practices, and, and other bad practices that women may have. So uh, all of us have to be extremely careful, but being in connect connection or being in contact with cows that are cared for uh, and uh, protected is very auspicious for everyone, uh, e even the big meat eaters because it's very purifying being near the cows and smelling them and serving them, and cleaning them, all these things. By the way, we have another program today at 12 o'clock. If you want to smell and, and touch Gobar and, and urine <laughs> and uh, serve the cows, you're welcome to come. So the bull and the cow are the symbols of the most offenseless living beings because even the stool and urine of these animals, animals are utilized to benefit human society. So that's a fact. The stool and urine, besides all the medical or uh, medicinal things they can do for the human being uh, on their skin and internally, is also beneficial for uh, fertilization or uh, having fertile soil full of uh, live uh, microorganisms and also uh, for building houses. Now, now a big thing coming up in India, they're making uh, gobar bricks for building houses. And, uh, and that's another, you know, when your house is made of gobar bricks, uh, it protects you from radiation, it keeps insects away, it keeps the house cool in the summer and warm in the winter. All these things miraculously uh, happen because of uh, the cow dung. So alive or dead, the cow and the bull are beneficial to human beings. Uh, uh, the dead body of a cow composted becomes extremely fertile uh, soil, and especially uh, they, they they stuff the uh, the horns of the of the dead cow with uh, gobar, and it and it uh, is digested and becomes excellent excellent uh, uh, compost. So, uh, will people understand these things? No, they anything that's good they think it's bad. Like for example, people have so many medicinal herbs growing in their garden, but they consider them noxious uh, weeds and they buy poison to kill them. They want to just have this green contaminated grass. They don't want any dandelions. They don't want any, uh, any of the other natural herbs that grow. Sometimes people you know, criticize me and say, oh, you should, you know, you, 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 why are you letting all these all these weeds grow? But they're not weeds. Almost every one of them is medicinal. You just don't know about it, that's all. And that's why I let them grow, because they are very beneficial if you know how to use them. Of course, if you don't know how to use them, then you don't realize their value, but they're extremely valuable. They're, there's at least 40 wild herbs that grow at, at, on, that, on that 10 acres that are medicinal and edible. So a little knowledge is a dangerous thing and bona fide knowledge is extremely beneficial for a person. The only thing that's keeping us in the material world is ignorance. And today, knowledge that's being taught is actually training people in ignorance. It's just like having a bottle <coughs> of poison labeled nectar. So you see the label nectar, you think, oh, it has to be good. 
but as soon as you drink it, you realize it's actually poison and it kills you. So that is what this mundane knowledge is. It's actually poison. It kills any vestige of Krishna consciousness by hearing it over and over and over again for 12, 15, 16, 18, 24 years or your whole life. So uh, this is the difference, Prabhupada says, between the reign of those pious kings and the modern states ruled by irresponsible executive heads without knowledge of the codes of God. So Prabhupada wrote a booklet called Dharma, uh, Laws of Nature. And it's a fantastic book because uh, it explains that basically there are two reigns or two sources of authority. One is the state in the material world and the other is Krishna. So there are two types of values that we have to learn about. One is the temporal values, and the other is the eternal values. And we are punished for violating each of them. So most people ignore completely the eternal values and the laws of nature, dharma, and they pay a little bit of attention to the material laws, you know, 35 mile an hour uh, sp speed zone, and things like that, pay your taxes, and don't cheat on the, the the IRS and so forth. But in the meantime, they're violating uh, fundamental laws of the universe, and because of that, they're suffering. And they say, well, I don't understand why I'm suffering. I'm, I'm a good person, I don't hurt anybody, and uh, you know, I only eat organic meat. I don't eat uh, the regular meat. And, uh, you know, I just don't understand what's going on here. You know, I know, how did I get cancer? You know, I don't smoke, I don't drink. And I eat everything organic. Just like once uh, <laughs> I met this really ignorant person. You know, I told him I'm a vegetarian and uh, I often eat raw food. He said, oh, I'm a raw foodist also. I said, really? I said, D Tell me what you eat. He said, I only eat raw meat. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is how crazy people are, you see. He was serious. He said, I only eat raw meat, right? So <laughs> what are we going to do? You know, we have to somehow or other, uh, see, the secret is you have to do things so good that people can't ignore it. Just like prashadam. It should be so good that even the worst meat eater says, wow, I never tasted anything as good as this. Say, so we have to become experts in all aspects of Krishna consciousness. Everything we do should be first class so that people say, well, I might not agree with their philosophy, but they're good people, and whatever they do, they do it right. Say. So eventually they say, well, if they're doing it right, and I'm doing it wrong, Maybe I should change sides. I should go from the wrong side to the right side, join these people, see? So it's very important that everything we do should be first class, should be exemplary, should be full of uh, affection and, and uh, giving and, and full of happiness, ecstasy. Okay, so the other day we started talking about who is responsible and I didn't really cover it completely, but I wanted to say a few more words about that before we end, uh, because this is what's happening here. This, you, you notice that uh, Parikshit, Maharaj Parikshit is asking uh, Bhumi Devi and, and, the, uh, uh, and the bull, he's saying, oh, who did this to you? Right? And he's not asking it once, he's asking it over and over again, but the, but the bull is not answering. And he will eventually, and uh, but he'll leave it open. He'll, he'll leave it open ended because he'll say, "I'm not. I don't. I'm not sure who's doing this. Who who is the perpetrator?" Although it's clear that the personality of Kali is the one that is beating him, but he's more subtle than that because there are two types of causes. One is called the remote cause, and one is called the immediate cause, or the material cause and the spiritual cause. So most people are just dealing with the immediate cause. Uh, but 
devotees know not even a blade of grass can move without the sanction of the Lord. So there's a bigger cause. And that's why Krishna says, Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchitananda Vigra Anadi Raja Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. He is the cause of all causes. So this gives people a complete different perspective. A devotee has a different perspective when he begins to understand this. So, number one is we cannot blame Krishna for things that are happening because they're happening, because he gives us limited free will. Now, you multiply the number of people in the world right now, they say there's uh, seven trillion people. That's seven trillion persons with limited free will. Well, that's like going to the uh, amusement park and getting into the crashing car, uh, what do you call that, the crashing car exhibit. You know, you, you get a car and, and the whole pleasure, the whole fun is crashing into another car, right? Well, that's what happens when you have seven billion people with limited free will. They're always going to be crashing into each other because how do they crash into each other? It just suffices for two people to want the same thing. Like the best example of that is Black Friday at Walmart, right? <laughs> Black Friday at Walmart is, uh, you know, like, like millions of people crashing into each other because they're all trying to get the same thing at the same time for different reasons. And their reasons seem perfectly justifiable to them enough to get into a fight. See? And you see that sometimes there's eight people holding on to something. There's one big fat lady holding on to it. some skinny guy. There's a kid. There's uh, somebody else. They're all holding on to the same thing and you see the looks on their face. Have you ever seen a photo like that on the internet? Yeah. That is what's actually happening because of limited free will. And why is that? Because ahammameti, I, me, and my mind syndrome, people want something for their own selfish purpose. And they're willing to kill for it sometimes and fight for it and struggle. That's the struggle for existence because Everyone ultimately is struggling with the laws of material nature, with the three modes of material nature, and they can't beat them. Therefore, they're ultimately all frustrated and defeated. So here we see that we cannot blame Krishna. Therefore, Krishna says, in fifth chapter, 14th verse of Bhagavad Gita, Nakar trit vam nakarmani lokasya sri jati prabhu nakarma phala sam yogam Swabhavas tu pavartate. The embodied spirit, master of the city of his body, does not create activities, nor does he induce people to act, nor does he create the fruits of action. All this is enacted by the modes of material nature. Now, this is a more subtle and frightening point that we're actually not in control of what's happening to us at all. We're being forced to do things. Prabhupada says, the living entity, as will be explained in the seventh chapter, is one of the energies or natures of the Supreme Lord, but is distinct from matter, which is another nature called inferior of the Lord. Somehow, the superior nature, the living entity, has been in contact with material nature since time immemorial. The temporary body or material dwelling place which he obtains is the cause of varieties of activities and their resultant reactions. Living in such a conditional atmosphere, one suffers the results of the activities of the body by identifying himself in ignorance with the body. So now the body, there's, there's two main parts of the body. There's the gross body and the subtle body. Now we see the gross body. We don't see the subtle body. I don't see your mind. You don't see my mind. I don't see your intelligence. I don't, you don't see my intelligence. It's only the effects of these things that we see, right? Just like one time when I was a kid, my brothers were gamblers. They loved to gamble. And, and, and they would go all the way from Philadelphia to 
someplace in Delaware to the horse races after working a whole day. And they drive there, it take two hours to get there and two hours to get back. And I went one time with them to see what's going on here. Why are they doing this? You know? <laughs> and then sometimes they'd be studying the, the horses during the day while they were working to see you know, which one they should bet on. So, and then this one time I went with them, I was only like 10 years old. They brought this guy called Doc. Doc was a man who was a pharmacist. He had a pharmacy in our neighborhood. And they brought him also because he was also a gambler. You know, so they were all buddies. So I go there. I don't know what's really happening. I, it's the first time I've ever been to such a place like that. And uh, so they were all betting. So I was just there watching, watching what they were doing. And, and there's thousands of people there. So my brothers had worked all day. At the same time, they were focused on which horses to bet on, right? And they, you know, they study, you know, what's the horse eating? What's its, what is it defecating? Uh, you know, who's the trainer? Who's this? Who's that? Just like you know, people study the stock market, right? The same thing for the horses, right? And uh, so they knew, you know, I mean, it's always the, the. Uh, the favorite horse and the least favorite horse, right? And then all the horses in between. So anyway, my brothers placed their bet. But I was interested in Doc because he was considered to be an intelligent guy in the neighborhood, right? That's why they called him Doc. And uh, so I was just watching him. So he went and he bought, he bought two tickets. And uh, I wasn't sure why he bought two tickets. So when the, you know, heart, the race started and my brother's up there screaming, everybody's screaming, you know, it's like, it's like devotees having a, a sankirtan, you know. <laughs> they're jumping up and down, they're screaming, they're squirming in their seat, they're pushing each other, I mean, they're going crazy, right? And they're screaming out their name, you know, just like we're screaming, Hadi Bo, you know, they're screaming out, you know, Blue Diamond, Blue Diamond, you know, like that, right? The names of the horses. So anyway, uh, the one that was favored to win lost. And the, the last horse that everyone was sure was going to lose won. So everyone you know, got really ang angry. So there was some of them were cursing. They got really upset. And they were ripping up their tickets and throwing them on the ground. But I noticed that Doc, he was not doing that. And he walked to the cash booth. And amazingly, he won a lot of money. So I was really interested, you know, and, and my brothers also, so they asked him, he said, Doc, what, what did you do? How come you, uh, which one did you bet on? He said, well, I bought two tickets. One was the favorite one with low odds, you know, nine to eight or 10 to two odds, something like that. And the other one was the last one. Uh, all the odds were against him. There was no chance for him to win. And uh, so what he basically he said he hedged his bet. Bet that means just like in the stock market, they have hedge funds. It's the same thing whether you go to stock market or whether you go to horse race or whether you go to casino. It's all gambling, right? So he hedged his bet by buying two tickets, the one that was least favored and the one that was most favored, and the least favored one won. So he won back the money that he lost on the on the first one, and he won a lot more money. So I was really, you know, impressed. You know, that's why they call him Doc because he was a he was a smart guy, right? But they were all dumb because they wasted their life, you know, hours and days. And, and I never went back again because I was very bored. But then I noticed another thing there. See, you, you can learn a lot by just watching people. There's there are a lot of people called Pennsylvania Dutch in in Pennsylvania and other places, and they're they always have these big beards and have these black uh, uh, farmer suits and white shirts. And, and uh, so I was sitting down somewhere and next to these two guys, they were Pennsylvania Dutch guys. And one of them was saying to the other, he said, Elmer, did you pick a winner? And Elmer said, Josh, I couldn't even pick my nose right tonight. <laughs> So, so I wasn't sure what that meant, right? but it stayed in my mind for a couple of years. And later on, I realized, you know, that they were basically talking nonsense and, bas and basically, you know, 
Elmer asked Josh, did you pick a winner? He said, I couldn't even pick my nose right tonight. So <laughs> that is exactly what happens to all the gamblers. I have never seen a gambler that was ahead, except if they were a cheater. They're all losers, and they're all going back to gamble just to win back what they've lost. See? So you have to be crazy to be even doing anything like that. Just like one time, I was watching a, uh, a uh, Discovery Channel, and they were talking about a new casino in, in uh, Las Vegas. And the name of the casino was the Taj Mahal, and it was $2 billion. So, you know, I, I was just watching it a few minutes, and then all of a sudden I saw something I couldn't believe. They focused in on a picture of a, uh, of a devotee, and it's a devotee that I know. And it's a devotee who's a Ritvik and a big, big, uh, let's say, critic of ISKCON, you know, saying, you know, no, ISKCON's not following Prabhupada, and, you know, it's always Prabhupada, Prabhupada. So this guy's in, inside the casino gambling, and, and mm -hmm. they, they focus in on him, and, they, and, and the guy is speaking, and say, you've got to be an idiot to walk into such a casino. Because the casino costs two billion dollars, right, to build. So obviously, the casinos are making money, and the people who are losing money are the idiots that walk into it. And they focus right on his face, and next to him was a woman who put her hand on his shoulder, and, and she had champagne and, a, and a champagne. Lit. And I was like bewildered. I said, "Who? How can this be?" And I looked three or four times. I came close to the television to look carefully at, at his face, and that was him. So about one year later, he came here to the temple. He comes every one or two years. And I said, Prabhu, I said, do you do Sankatan in Las Vegas? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I go there. So, you know, it's really good there. I said, really? So well, where do you do it? He said, oh, I, I'll set up outside of one of the casinos. I said, did you ever set up uh, outside of Taj Mahal? He said, yeah, how did you know? I said, no, I'm just guessing. I said, uh, did you ever go into the casino? Oh, only if I have to go to the bathroom, you know. Oh, really? Okay. I said, you know, I was watching this thing about, you know, the opening of the casino, and I saw you sitting at a table and uh, throwing the dice. So, oh, yeah. Well, no, because I'm a handsome guy, they paid me money to sit there. I said, really? Did they pay you to gamble? I said, well, he said it was their money. It wasn't my money. I said, but who was that woman next to you? He said, I don't know. So <laughs> it was him, right? And he was actually gambling. So you see, this is free will. It couldn't be any better. And he's like big critic of Iskand, always criticizing, right? So anyone at any time can fall down. And it's nobody else's fault but their own fault. And that's basically what's being said here that we're living in a conditional atmosphere. One suffers the results of the activities of the body by identifying himself in ignorance with the body. It is ignorance acquired from time immemorial that is the cause of bodily suffering and distress. As soon as the living entity becomes aloof from the activities of the body, he becomes free from the reactions as well. As long as he is in the city of the body, he appears to be the master of it, but actually he is neither its proprietor nor controller of its actions and reactions. He is simply in the midst of the material ocean, struggling for existence. The waves of the ocean are tossing him and he has no control over them. His best solution is to get out of the water by transcendental Krishna consciousness. That alone will save him from all turmoil. So the main point here is at what point do we become responsible? If he's saying that we're not actually in control. So how can we be responsible? That's explained also in the 18th chapter where Prabhupada writes, he says, So he says, in the 18th chapter, verse 17, one who is not motivated by false ego, whose intelligence is not entangled, though he kills men in this world, does not kill, 
nor is he bound by his actions. All right, so Arjuna was killing people, right? But he was not responsible for anything because he was only acting on Krishna's order. So in this verse, Prabhupada writes, the Lord informs Arjuna that the desire not to fight arises from false ego. Arjuna thought himself to be the doer of action, but he did not consider the supreme sanction within and without. If one, the supreme sanction is, there are five factors of work, that is, sense, the body, the senses, the person, the place, and the endeavor, I'm sorry, the endeavor, and then Krishna, the supreme, the super soul, those are the five factors. But one, uh, if one does not know the super sanction is there, why should he act? But one who knows the instruments of work himself as the worker and the Supreme Lord as the Supreme Sanctioner is perfect in doing everything. Such a person is never an illusion. Personal ac activity and responsibility arise from false ego and godlessness or a lack of Krishna consciousness. Anyone who is acting in Krishna consciousness under the direction of Super Soul or the Supreme Personality Godhead, even though killing does not kill, nor is he ever affected by the reaction of such killing. When a soldier kills under the command of a superior officer, he's not subject to be judged. But if a soldier kills on his own personal account, then he is certainly judged by a court of law. So this responsibility arises from false ego and godlessness. That's when we are responsible for what we do. So we can't claim that, oh, it's not me, I was forced to do it, no. Uh, we make decisions in our life, and if those decisions are made in ignorance, we are responsible. Hare Krishna, all glories to Sila Prabhupada. Okay. Are there any questions? Hare Bo, all glories to Sila Prabhupada.